Before we begin, I'd like to first respectfully acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. We offer our gratitude to the Mohawks of Akwesasne for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. In honoring those teachings, we are committed to the process of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism through good relations with each other and the lands that we live and work on. The River Institute was founded in 1994 in partnership with the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne. We are grateful for the time and knowledge that our neighbors graciously give to us, and we strive to improve the health of the Great River and surrounding lands. So, again, welcome back uh, to our new season of Science and Nature. My name is Stephanie Hildebrand. I take care of the visual communications at uh, the River Institute, but I also host uh, this event. Uh, Norm Seymour will be our speaker for tonight. I met Norm maybe three and a half years ago. He was very closely watching one of the projects here at the River Institute, the Great River Report, uh, and he had great interest in what we were doing. And uh, my boss, Lee Magahi, really jumped on that opportunity to speak to somebody who knew the river so well. And so Norm is an author, a professor. He's been on the river for over 80 years. And so tonight he'll be talking about 80 years of changes on Lake St. Francis. And if you're not familiar, Lake St. Francis is basically the part of the river that starts at the dam all the way to Valley Field in Montreal. Um, Valley Field, yeah, to the Beauharnois Dam. So I guess without further ado, welcome Norm. Maybe I'll let you banter a little bit before so that you know the, the people who are paying their parking uh, don't yeah, miss too much. But yeah, so thank you and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Steph. Um, I don't usually use notes, but in the last couple of years, I seem to be forgetting things from time to time. So uh, uh, I, I am going to, uh, uh, but let me say, just, just to uh, maintain my, my place in terms of uh, the sequence, uh, uh, just to a couple of things. Uh, I'd like this to be interactive in the sense that if I say something that uh, you really like, jump up and down and say you really like it. Or if you don't, maybe we can have a bit of a discussion about it. But for the most part, uh, unless it, it's the sort of thing that's pressing, uh, we'll wait uh, until a little bit later. But I'm happy to be here for as long uh, as you folks uh, want me to be. And uh, that 80 years of experience, well, uh, yeah, and uh, I, was, I was five years old when, we, uh, when my grandmother uh, bought it and said this is a place where uh, it would be really nice for the grandkids to uh, grow up and whatnot. Probably have some, maybe some genetic predisposition uh, to enjoy nature. I hunt and fish. Uh, but uh, as a, as a, just a general, uh, let's say, observer of life in general, uh, I found the river such a wonderful forum to learn about uh, not only birds and fish and what have you, but about people and myself. Uh, so uh, I, I've been, I've been uh, involved uh, every year of my life in some aspect of uh, of the river. And for 37 years I studied uh, and taught at a small university in Nova Scotia. And uh, each summer though I would come up, wife and family, and spend some time studying principally ospreys and also ducks. Uh, black ducks, which you rarely see anymore, and mallard ducks, which you see almost everywhere, the so-called marina duck, uh, and, and I've studied their interactions, I've studied their mating relationships, I've gotten right into the heads of some of them, I think, and figured out maybe a little bit of what, of what they're thinking. I like to think so, anyway. So what I'm going to do, uh, just before I get started in the specifics, is, is mention a couple of things that uh, Stephanie alluded to. Uh, I think the, the Institute's 
a wonderful uh, aspect of the community. I think it brings together now uh, Akrazazny, very important. It brings together the community at large, and it, it, it espouses, what's the terminology I'm looking for? Um, where am I? Sharing the excitement of scientific discovery. Uh, I like that. Well, I was a reluctant, or I, yes, in the early days, uh, I had great difficulty with school. And uh, uh, I, I left before, <laughs> before my time. But I finally got back to school and became a, uh, uh, a scientist. And as a hunter, that was kind of interesting. I wrote a book, I guess 15, 20 years ago now, called Living a Dream, The Education of a Duck Hunter. The, the dream was I've been able to hunt and fish all over the world and whatnot, but the, the education part was learning that there's so much more about these creatures than just going out and shooting one, catching a fish, whatever it might be. Uh, and, and so now I'd like to talk about my experience on Lake St. Francis kind of from that perspective, okay? So uh, maybe some of you don't like the idea that I hunt and fish, um, particularly the hunting. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that now, but I'd be very happy to talk about it from a, an ecological perspective at some point. But what I want to do is go through with you some of my experiences that I've had on the river, and I've had a lot of them. I've spent a lot of time on the river. Um, just going back to the business of science, science is wonderful in that it puts some structure on observations that we make as individuals. Um, people who don't have the scientific background may not have a, a framework or a structural uh, organization to think about things. So they are very limited in the sense that they have, they, they have to work from the basis of, of experience. It's very, very, very important. But experience gives you uh, the opportunity uh, to, to formulate an opinion. Uh, but, but if you also have a little bit of scientific exposure directly or indirectly, it helps you to have a more informed opinion. So I like to think that my opinion is informed, but I'm also very careful about what I say. Uh, I'll say something, uh, but it's almost always going to be a little bit qualified. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about, uh, and here's where my notes come in, um, is some of my experiences on the river, and first of all, let's look at let's look at ducks. Um, over the years, there have been some profound changes in the distribution and abundance of duck and abundance of ducks here. At one time, the dominant species, at least in the migratory sense was the lesser and greater scop. Uh, these birds, which the hunter calls a bluebill for obvious reasons, uh, bluebill, uh, these ducks used to number in the tens of thousands on Lake St. Francis. Uh, they, would, they would migrate down the lesser scop from the prairies, the greater scop from the boreal forest, and they would they, they, they would be everywhere on the lake. Uh, unfortunately, uh, now, if you see a scop, uh, their numbers are still in the hundreds, but, but that ain't tens of thousands. And there's a couple of reasons for it. One, a continental decline, which we're not entirely sure just what it was or what it is that's causing it. Uh, a combination of over-harvest, over-hunting, but almost always habitat is the underlying uh, culprit, let's say, when you have a decline in animals. Uh, let me just mention something about uh, habitat. 
Habitat is where the animal lives, how it's able to survive, how it's able to reproduce, how the population is maintained. Almost always, when you see a decline in a species, you look first at the habitat. The habitat is, like I say, the home of the animal. And without a home, they're at, at loose ends, just like we are. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the habitat's extremely important. And habitat on Lake St. Francis has changed over the years profoundly. One of the really exciting things that I've found, and it's been very informative to me, is this report by the River Institute. Uh, yellow perch, population in the Upper St. Lawrence River. Very, very interesting. Uh, I know the, the yellow perch from way back. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I've been very involved in looking at the possible impact of fishing on perch. Uh, people who don't have, let's say, the benefit, let's say, of a, a scientific background very often point to a specific, uh, in their opinion, reason for a decline. And maybe it's bang on, but maybe not. Uh, the, uh, the perch, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here. I think I mentioned I was going to talk about ducks. Uh, as a matter of fact, thanks for the water. That'll change my pace for me a little bit. Uh, uh, let, let's talk about Let's go back and talk about the ducks because I want to talk about perch in more, in more detail. Okay, so uh, for, for those of you who know what a black duck is, anybody know what a black duck is? There's a van. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, not many. Okay, not many, though. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Okay, here's the story uh, on black ducks and mallards. They're closely related species. Almost everybody knows a mallard. It's always the bird that you're going to see in a magazine, the male with the, black, or with the uh, green head and the, uh, the white uh, uh, neck strap, beautiful russet breast. Some, something that is really very obvious. That's the duck we see in the spring here, uh, the male courting the female and what have you. Anyway, and then later the, uh, the ducklings. The black duck, though, is, is, is a much more, oh, how would you describe it, uh, understated, excuse me, understated uh, duck, but it's also a mallard. Okay, they evolve from the same ancestral stock. And the black duck uh, is, is a different creature in a behavioral sense <clears throat> because they... They're, they're, they're much warier. Uh, they're much more, uh, uh, oh, reclusive, I guess, almost, you'd say. Uh, and one of the problems that has happened here on the St. Lawrence, and it began, oh, probably in the late 50s, early 60s, the, uh, the mallards started to move in from the prairies. And they started to compete with the black duck for the same habitat the same nesting areas, and because the male mallard is very much more aggressive than the male black duck, the mallard displaced the black duck. That was bad, but what was even worse was their tendency to, to uh, uh, interbreed. Uh, and one of the problems with the interbreeding is that uh, the female black duck and this is probably some genetic thing, at least in part, uh, prefers when she's being courted between, or by a male black duck and a male uh, mallard, she prefers the mallard. Nine out of ten times, she's going to choose the mallard. And so, she mates with him, they have their ducklings, and the ducklings, the females, the hybrids now, they also prefer the mallard. So here's a situation where between the competition and the so-called interbreeding here, 
uh, mallard or black ducks have come out very much second best. You hardly see them at all. It used to be the only duck you saw in that sense. Uh, mallards, I remember hunting with my uncle in 1961, and uh, we shot two mallards. None of, none of the people uh, back on shore knew what the heck they were. It was really interesting. That's not going back so far. And now the mallard, or the black duck, is, is, is a foreigner when you see him here. So an interesting sort of thing um, to think that uh, we've got a situation where, <coughs> excuse me, um, there's a bit of an, an almost 100% displacement of one duck as a consequence of the other. So you notice that certainly on the, uh, uh, on the lake. Uh, where am I going with this? Okay, now one of the things that's, that's kind of interesting is we're really caught up in, in um, the business of uh, climate change, speaking of habitat changes and what have you. Uh, just a little aside, black ducks in Nova Scotia, one of their last strongholds, so there's relatively few mallards there. One of the things that's interesting is that um, there's an incestuous relationship there. Uh, the black ducks used to be migratory uh, but they're not any longer migratory because in Nova Scotia, the climate's changed sufficiently that these birds can now winter there. And one of the things that's happening is that a, uh, a young female uh, will look around for a mate, and there's a very high tendency that because they don't migrate anymore and they don't disperse on the wintering grounds, she'll choose, excuse me, a relative, uh, an uncle, a grandfather, a close cousin, or perhaps her father. And, and here's a situation then where climate change has resulted in a profound change in a population, that sort of thing. So kind of, a, kind of an interesting sort of, sort of thing. Uh, okay, I just want to mention uh, one thing about... Uh, Another species of duck that we don't see here hardly at all, the blue-winged teal. Anybody familiar with blue-winged teal? Okay, so, but they're essentially gone. And that used to be the early season hunting on blue-winged teal. Uh, but they, they are an interesting bird that <coughs> undergoes a so-called feather molt. I remember spending hours at the east end of Hamilton Island, watching blue-winged teal courting and what have you. And the male, beautiful bluish head, uh, the powder blue wings uh, that give the bird the name, uh, these lovely orange feet and a dark, dark black bill. Just a, just a gorgeous creature. And they'd be courting the females, and the females would be, of course, uh, showing in total indifference but it couldn't always have been indifference because they ended up, some of them made it, and the ducklings happened too. So anyway, uh, um, so I would, let's say September, when the hunting season started, I would say to my, uh, to my uncle, man, uh, where, are all the, where are all the male bla uh, blueing tail? And he... Uh, never, never shy about giving an opinion, said, oh, well, they all migrated. They go early. They leave before the females. Oh, that, that's kind of interesting. But then I was in the Cornwall Public Library one day, uh, and I spent time in the library reading stuff uh, that I wanted to read, maybe not the stuff the teachers, my teachers wanted me to read, but that's another issue. Anyway, I read about the molt, the feather molt, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you will. Well, male birds are brightly colored, typically speaking, because they've got to compete for a female. Uh, but those bright feathers come at a cost because they're more vulnerable be to uh, being picked off uh, by a predator. So after the breeding season is over, it doesn't make much sense being brightly colored. 
nothing's going to happen anyway. The females are disinterested. And you might as well get rid of the black or the uh, colorful feathers uh, and look like a female. And that's exactly what happens with these birds. The male loses his, his feathers, his, his uh, colorful feathers, replaces them with uh, a brown feather, looks very much like the, the female. And if you look at mallard ducks now, okay, if you live along the river and you're interested in watching ducks, they all look like females, actually, but they're not. About 80% of the ducks you see looking like females are, in fact, males, and they'll start to get then their, their bright colors, their courtship colors, again, sometime early in October. So kind of an interesting sort of thing. Uh, and all of that was happening down there uh, around Hamilton Island, and now you don't see a teal. Rarely. I saw two the other day with my grandson. I was pretty excited. He didn't have the same excitement, but anyway. Uh, Canada geese. At one time, a goose was a rarity. You'd see them in, in uh, March, end of March, uh, early April. And these were birds that were migrating north from the southern uh, wintering grounds uh, up to James Bay and Hudson Bay, and they'd be, <coughs> they'd be nesting on both sides of the bay. You'd see them again in October for about 10 days or so, and then they'd be gone. But now, uh, if somebody heard me talking about the rarity of a Canada goose, they'd think I was crazy, and they would you know, I would be if I thought they were rare because they're anything but, right? If you're a golfer or maybe even just somebody with waterfront property and a nice lawn, uh, you know what a Canada goose is for sure. Anyway, uh, the geese are interesting because the geese that we have here, uh, there's about a dozen different sub, not subspecies, but different races. Uh, and this one is called Branta canadensis. Maxima. In other words, Maxima. It's, it's the biggest of all of these different groups, uh, or different uh, uh, races of geese. Back, I don't know, I guess it would still be in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, um, these uh, there were geese that were caught, uh, trapped in the, in the so-called interlake area of Manitoba between Lakes Winnipeg in Lake Manitoba, and these birds were taken uh, as ducklings, raised, and then released in places like Morrisburg, for example. And one of the things that happens with these geese, because they tend not to migrate very far, historically and over evolutionary time, there are ducks or there are geese that haven't migrated very far, so they have uh, a tendency to stay close to home. The reason we now have so many geese is twofold. One, uh, that let's call it the Morrisburg experiment took off extremely well. And now we have a population of geese that, well, most people feel are overpopulated. But the interesting thing is that uh, they uh, the, the seeding, if you will, of the geese uh, has made it possible now for us to, all along Lake St. Saint, Lake Saint Francis, see a goose just about whenever we want to and sometimes when we don't. Uh, one other very interesting story, uh, goose-wise, is the uh, snow goose, the greater snow goose. So you're familiar with, with the big white geese that uh, you occasionally see and whatnot? So back in the 1930s, that population of geese, that whole species of geese, dropped down to about somewhere around 5,000. Okay, now, this is a, a success story. Dropped down to about 5,000. And the whole population on, on uh, northward migration from the Chesapeake Bay area of the states up to Baffin Island and uh, Violet Island where they breed, 
um, that would go through Cap Termont, east of Quebec City. Okay? And they'd spend the month, approximately the, uh, the month of April there, before going farther north. Then, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, when, uh, after the breeding season, and they were migra migrating south, they'd go through uh, Cap Tremont again. And we were able to keep a very, very close uh, count of how many there, there were. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that <coughs> me, sometimes people play a very, very important role on making things happen. Well, the River Institute. Um, there was a, uh, uh, there was, speaking of geese, uh, there was a, uh, there was a monastery, or there, yes, there was a monastery there, uh, and, and it was quite interesting because the monastery uh, controlled almost all of the habitat, the goose habitat around Cap Tremont, uh, and they would lease their land out to a hunting club. And the hunting club, and the hunting club um, <clears throat> put, put particular, they hunted, but they put very, very close uh, uh, limits on what they shot. And between they and, and the uh, monks, they were protecting that population of geese. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So here was a situation where uh, between those two uh, community, let's call them community-minded community people, they were uh, having a very, very significant uh, influence on the population. Now, slowly over time, and you'll notice, uh, or not notice, but, uh, but you'll recognize the fact that this is a, and a very important area, agriculturally speaking, as corn and soybean became more abundant as a crop, uh, these geese started to increase. Not only that, there were habitat changes in the north, uh, milder temperatures, so that reproduction uh, was more successful. They were a boom or bust type of animal. Either they reproduce very successfully or not at all. And these birds, something like about 15 out of every 20 years, they had a boom population. Those birds moved their, their numbers from around that 5,000 slowly over time to the point where there's 600,000 of them now. And, and their doubling time is every 12 years. So they've become a real, a real issue in many places because they're overutilizing, overeating their habitat and creating problems for themselves and other birds. But uh, I just saw uh, before I came up uh, a couple days ago, uh, six greater snow geese here. And it's interesting because uh, they were all adults. You can tell the males from, or the uh, uh, adults from the uh, young by coloration. And these six geese almost certainly came down to Lake St. Francis, thinking of the cropland, the soybean, the corn, and what have you. Who knows what they were thinking, but let's say that. And they came here probably because in the north this year, where they breed, uh, there was a lot of predation. And uh, they almost, well, speculation, of course, they almost certainly were unsuccessful reproducing. And so they left because they didn't have to worry about looking after their young and waiting until the young uh, grew strong enough to join them on migration. So here we have a population of, or an, ex an extension of the uh, geese out from Cap Tremont, now up to uh, here. And uh, last year, I forget the numbers, but there were something like about 50,000 geese that moved through Lake St. Francis. Uh, and something that at one time, oops, oh, I'm losing, uh, Talk about losing my place, eh? Thank you. A anyway, so so just kind of a kind of an interesting sort of thing. Okay, so what I'd like to now just mention uh, briefly are the ospreys. Um, ospreys um, 
Uh, ospreys uh, are a success story. Um, I saw my first osprey on Lake St. Francis when, oh, I don't know, I was about uh, 12 years old or so fishing perch at the east end of Renshaw Island. And, and, and I saw this hawk come along and uh, hover, uh, wondering what the heck it, it was doing, and then it plummeted into the, into the water and uh, caught a catfish. Now that's kind of an interesting story in itself, I think. A catfish. Catfish live predominantly on the bottoms of the, uh, you know, of the, uh, of, of, the, of the river. How did an osprey get a catfish? Well, I had not noticed uh, before all of this happened that there was activity on the surface and I went over and it was a catfish swimming around in circles. And it would drop down and then come back up and drop down and come back up. And, and I thought nothing more of it, although I thought it was strange that it was, a, it was on the surface. And one of the things that's very interesting is my, uh, my son-in-law, who's a veterinarian, was reading a research paper last year. And he said, I think I've come up with the, a possible reason why uh, the, the ospreys are able to get catfish. And uh, he said, look, he said, they have a virus, okay, they, they, they can uh, uh, get a virus that makes them blind. And when they are blind, they become disoriented. And they come up to the surface and flop around on the surface. And that's when the osprey can get them. And I did a little study, just a kind of a horseback uh, uh, research study. And I was seeing about around three or four nests that I was checking out, I was seeing about 70% of the, uh, of the fish residue, they were catfish. So an interesting sort of thing, because if you knew something about catfish and you knew something about ospreys, but not both, you'd wonder how all of this was happening. So uh, an interesting sort of thing, but ospreys are fascinating creatures. So... I studied them for about 20 years in Nova Scotia, and uh, you see the same thing happening here, um, but, but we studied them pretty intensively. Uh, just a couple things about, about uh, uh, ospreys that you may not know. Uh, they tend to breed for life, okay? Or, uh, sorry, mate for life. Uh, uh, but um, uh, that's not always true. If 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 if, um, if they're be, sorry, if they've been unsuccessful in reproduction, the female presumably thinks, well, maybe somebody else might be a better bet. Maybe the male thinks the same thing. Well, who knows? Because they do change partners and dance. Anyway, uh, just a couple of things. There's a lot of individual variation in these ospreys. And while they're all, they all fish, some of the males are better fishermen than others. Uh, and the male does all of, the, all of the foraging, all of the fishing, when the female is uh, tied to the nest, uh, which, which is considerable. Uh, it's, it's about a seven-month, or sorry, a seven-week uh, period between laying her eggs and fledging her young. Anyway. Excuse me. Oh, have a, have a drink of water, <laughs> Stephanie. Absolutely, my savior here. Oh my goodness. Um, so there's some fishermen that are the, some osprey males that are better fishermen than others, and I had a student who was studying a colony of ospreys. There were, there were six or seven nests uh, distributed along power poles, uh, and every second power pole there would be a nest. And, those, and that colony was midway between two estuaries where the, uh, the, um, where the males fed on flounders. And... She noticed that every so often 
early in the morning, uh, two or three of the males would fly up over the colony and just circle. And then it became clear to her what they were doing. They were waiting for this one particular male. And we had s several of these birds marked, so we knew who was who. She was waiting for one of these males to leave the nest area and fly to one of the estuaries, one or the other of the estuaries. Uh, he was a male who knew where the fish were, so he wasn't spending time circling around the colony. He was just making a beeline for the, uh, for the estuary. And when he did that, the ones that were doing the circling around followed him. And here's a situation where uh, they may not have been all that great at fishing, but they were smart enough to know who the good fisherman was. So anyway, and a cool thing that happens, you would see, you would see maybe eight or ten osprey males uh, uh, hovering about a particular patch of habitat where there were, where there were uh, flounders. And uh, an osprey has no particular problem once it has decided to make the uh, dive. They're successful on something like about 80% of, of their dives. Anyway, so catching the fish is not a problem. Finding it is, but you, uh, these guys were going, uh, following Buddy to where the fish were. Uh, but when they were all hovering around, I, when I first started seeing this, I uh, couldn't figure out why. They were all just waiting, and then something would happen, and one would dive, then another would dive, and another would dive, all over the mat, uh, you know, a matter of about uh, about a minute or so. Uh, what was happening is the flounders, okay, would know the ospreys were up there, and they would they would go down onto the bottom, and flip their their fins, and uh, cause a uh, uh, a plume of, of, of uh, sediment to go up and come down on them, and it would cover them beautifully, and they're, you know, they're cryptically color, colored on the top anyway. Uh, but there'd maybe be 30, 40, 50 flounders, and we'd observe them from a tower. Uh, the, uh, uh, one, of, one, of the, uh, one of the flounders would lose its cool, knowing that the ospreys were up there, and take off and, and hit, hit the ground again, make a little plume of uh, sediment. Uh, and it was the plume of sediment that we, we believe, anyway, that one of the ospreys would have seen, dove down, and as soon as he hit the water, the other flounders would lose their composure and take off and hit the sediment, uh, hit, hit the bottom again. And the other uh, birds up there would say, aha, that's the one I'm going for. So it was a kind of an interesting sort of a, um, uh, what, uh, a communal activity, if you will. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, we're, uh, I'm rushing through this right now. I want to get to Perch for a couple of minutes here. Uh, hey, Stephanie, where are you? Uh, are we still okay? Uh, I haven't checked the are, are we okay? Uh, do people want to? Are you? Okay. Okay, let's, let's just. Uh, Osprey. Oh, my God. I had so much to tell you about ospreys. <laughs> like marriage and ospreys. Oh, I got to tell you. I got, just got to tell you briefly marriage and ospreys. I had a student, and we used to, uh, we used to get together on the campus pub to talk about uh, our research, and uh, he said, uh, uh, he came in one, one evening and he said, uh, I've got evidence of marriage in ospreys. So I said, marriage in ospreys, well, how did you determine that? And so he said, well, he said, I was watching a male bringing sticks to the female, okay? And the male brings the sticks, the female takes the sticks and builds the nest. Okay. And he said it, it, he'd been doing it for about three days, and her nest was getting pretty close to being completed. But in the early days, that first day, 
The male had brought a stick, and it was clearly too long for the nest. But <clears throat> the female worked at it and kind of wedged it in the base of the nest. And he said, uh, I never thought anything more about it until she had the nest almost complete. And at the end of a day, Buddy brought the last stick of the day. Now, <clears throat> with any luck, these males, if they're pretty good at bringing sticks and whatnot and to keep the sticks coming, the female will have sex with them. And so you can imagine why Buddy's bringing home the sticks. <laughs> so he brings home that last stick and the female takes it and she puts it in the nest and he's flying around, flying around thinking, well, you know, maybe. So he's looking for a place to land, <coughs> excuse me, nest, next to the nest. Circles the nest a little bit, checks the scene out, and then slowly goes down and lands on the very end of the stick that's protruding out from the nest. Well, uh, he said, I watched, I knew what was going to happen, and he said, slowly, slowly, the nest starts to teeter. And Buddy's sitting there looking, thinking, oh man, <laughs> this is not a good idea. But by the time he left, the nest came crashing down, oh. crashing down. And <laughs> uh, we're having a few beers, they're in the campus pub, things are pretty relaxed, and so I won't you know, uh, continue his speculation too much, but he did say that, look, for the next three days, no matter how many sticks he brought, no matter how, fish, how many fish he brought, he was well and truly cut off, and he said, if that's not an indication of <laughs> marriage and ospreys, what the hell is? So, anyway, anyway... <laughs> Okay, just, just, just very briefly, okay, uh, um, uh, perch. Per perch are a big deal on Lake St. Francis, the so-called perch culture, if you will. Uh, and there's, uh, there, there's, there's a mythology about perch. Uh, we call them the Lancaster perch as if there's something special about Lancaster. Well, maybe there is, but... Probably not as far as the perch is concerned. Uh, I, re I remember uh, being in Lake Baikal in, in Siberia and uh, seeing perch there. And they were the same perch as we have here. And I'm thinking, man, uh, we, uh, Andrea, you'll remember uh, eating perch in Lake Baikal. And uh, uh, they weren't perch, uh, weren't perch rolls or anything like that. They, they just had a perch, and these are big perch, and, and in warm water, uh, and they were, they were uh, gutted, and they were scaled, uh, but otherwise, that was your perch meal. They called it perch soup. Well, I think that's what they were saying. Anyway, but there is something special about the perch, and, and when I worked in the, uh, the Howard Smith paper mill, uh, after I left... Uh, uh, high school in disgrace. Um, uh, I, I used to I, I used to get off a, 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 a shift at seven o'clock, and especially in the spring of the year, uh, go ice fishing. And back then, I was selling perch for seventy-five cents a pound. And now, if you can find somebody to buy perch from. Okay, I've changed my ways, remember, right? I've become educated with perch, just like with ducks. Uh, uh, if you can find somebody to sell you a perch because of their scarcity, uh, you're not paying 75, 75 cents. I mean, it's serious money, you know, 15 bucks or something like that. Uh, anyway, there has always been a, a culture of, of perch fishermen. Uh, and there was always perch around. Uh, you could, you know, the guy, the guy could take his, uh, his kids out on a Sunday afternoon almost anywhere, drop the anchor, and find perch. Uh, not anymore. 
Now, what are the reasons for it? Well, one of the things that I found extremely enlightening was in this report, we're talking about uh, a, uh, uh, excuse me, the history of perch, of history, I guess we'll use that term, history of perch uh, on Lake St. Francis since probably uh, colonization, uh, beginning colonization. And what this report is suggesting, although it's always going to be a, uh, a report in progress in a sense because things are always changing, but probably uh, when you look at various aspects of water chemistry, uh, human impact has had a tremendous impact uh, or, uh, has, yeah has had a tremendous impact on perch and it looks like it looks like there's been uh, increases and decreases depending upon what we put in the river phosphorus various things like that uh, and and it looks very much like the perch here in Lake St. Francis uh, has gone through peaks and troughs in terms of numbers and it's almost certainly related to habitat, to water chemistry, to the way water chemistry influences vegetation, and the way vegetation then influences their food, like various invertebrate, aquatic insects, that sort of thing, invertebrates. And I was chatting uh, with a fellow today, and we were talking about something that uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the last time I saw one of these things, but there's a little, a little uh, crustacean called a gamerous, or locally known as freshwater shrimp. Uh, some people might refer to them as scuds. At one time, you'd bring your anchor in uh, off the bottom, put it in the boat. It'd have vegetation on it. And before very long, the bottom of your boat would be, and I'm going to stick my neck out a little bit here and say, covered in these gamerous. And as a kid, I used to go to where the gamerous were in the various vegetation to fish perch. And now, there are hardly any gamerous. There, there, you know, there are hardly any at all. Now, that has to have some impact on the perch. Uh, other things, of course, you have a so-called top-down influence too, like uh, predation. Uh, well, let's, before we talk about predation, talk about competition. Competition with other species, like invasive species, like gobies, the fall fish, these kinds of, these kinds of competitors for the food resource has to have an impact on the reproductive potential of the, uh, not potential, but reproductive activity of the fish. So, if you look at other things, uh, uh, the so-called top-down uh, influence, predation. Uh, predation is interesting because there are two, or there, there is a, um, a belief in the area that cormorants have been the reason why the population has declined. And there's no question in my mind, certainly, um, that the population has declined. Uh, but predation is kind of subtle in many respects. The cormorant, I think, has become a scapegoat, especially with fishermen, who believe, <clears throat> excuse me, that because the cormorant eats however many uh, um, fish a day, that sort of thing, that um, they must be the culprit. There's never any one culprit. It's habitat, it's in this case predation, but one of the biggest predators is you and me, right? Not only that, the old cormorant is going after fish about gay size, young fish, that are in many cases not going to make it to adulthood anyway. So uh, they're not going to be part of the uh, a reproductive picture of the population. Uh, fishermen go after the big fish, uh, especially when you used to be able to fish them on the ice. 
uh, uh, in the spring of the year, just before the ice was uh, ready to move out, uh, you'd be catching the big females filled with eggs. That has to have some impact on what's going on in the population. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that in Lac Saint Pierre, uh, the perch fishery has been closed for a number of years because of that huge lake. Uh, it became extremely difficult to find a perch. And one wonders to what extent the fishing impacted that, especially commercial fishing. Apparently there were many licenses for commercial fishing on the lake, on Lake St. Pierre. So on Lake St. Francis, our decline in perch has come as quite a shock for people. But things have been changing on the lake. Uh, that whole, Perch culture, uh, when I say the perch culture, the fishermen uh, are, are just not there anymore. You can still go out and find perch. I mean, you know, no question. But Buddy can't take his kids out on a, any Sunday afternoon in the summer and find perch. Uh, it just doesn't happen anymore. But it's a, a multifaceted issue. And here we have a situation where uh, I found that very enlightening. Even though I know about habitat and how fundamentally uh, uh, critical habitat is to population distribution and abundance, it still required me to read through this and think, whoa, uh, this is one of the really great things of being able to blend science and experience and what have you and come up with something that puts a very nice perspective on things. So. Uh, when we we're thinking about the perch and the uh, demise of the perch culture, that is the fishing culture, uh, we don't blame any one thing. Uh, we look at a number of things, including our own activities. And uh, I shouldn't have been selling those perch for 75 cents a pound. Uh, my God, if I was, anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, so look, I got lots of little stories to tell you, but you know, I don't want you to all drop off to sleep. I don't want you to be like my students used to be, you know, and I'd go on and on and on or something. So I think I've had about as much to say uh, as I should. But how about questions? How about, you know, how about some feedback and what have you? Uh, Where did the perch spawn? Did they spawn in this river or did it go up into the tributaries? Uh, both. For example, the Raisin River had a very very good uh, population of spawning perch, which seems to be almost non-existent right now. So something specific is going on with the river uh, as, a, as habitat sort of thing. Um, so hard to say. But where, where the bulk of the perch spawn uh, is uh, uh, in, the, in the sandy sediments, or not sandy, but uh, detritus sediments, uh, particularly at the east end in coves and bays at the east end of the islands uh, and along the shoreline too. So uh, yeah, I would say the bulk of them are, are in the river, in the main part of the river, in the main part of the lake, that sort of thing. Oh, there must be something more yeah. here. No, Don't leave me on my, my own I'll here. Just hold it next to okay, yeah. so what did happen, what happened to the decline of blue-winged teal, gadwall, widgeon? All those things have declined. You don't see hardly any of those particular Okay, seasons. so are you a hunter or were you a hunter? Yes. Okay. Yes. So. And canvas back? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're gone. Yeah. So there's been a continental decline in the so called diving ducks, the canvas backs, the scop, the bluebills, that sort of thing. Uh, And always been, Lake St. Francis has always been a fringe area, even though there might be uh, 50,000 uh, uh, bluebills out on Lake St. Francis, uh, there are places where they uh, numbered in the millions, okay? The St. Clair Flats, for example, up, uh, uh, well, Lake St. Uh, Lake St. Clair. Now, what has happened, I think, is that hunting is an industry. Right, and uh, research grants, particularly 
or in the states anyway, research grants uh, have been um, uh, uh, have been very uh, heavily politicized. It makes sense if you. Uh, no, I'm, only, I'm getting too involved. Um, uh, the the decline in ducks, okay, is something that nobody wants to see. In part because there's a big economic component to it. But at one time when we did our continental uh, survey of ducks, we only ever counted mallards. This goes back to about 1935. Uh, but in order to keep the numbers up, and I'm I'm being uh, pretty cynical here, but I think I'm being pretty right too. We now count every duck we see on these on these surveys, so much so uh, that uh, uh, the Wildlife Service says uh, things aren't that bad. Uh, the numbers are down, but they're uh, the ducks are somewhere. Well, we can count damn near every duck there is on the continent now with our new technology, and it's the sort of thing where I think what has happened is we have over-harvested some species, okay? And so combining the habitat loss, so for example, the prairie where the bluebills nested, um, the bulk of the bluebills nested, uh, it, it, it's been given over to agriculture, okay? So how could you possibly have the numbers that we used to have back in the 60s and 70s when, when the habitat is just not there? Almost never does habitat alone impact a population uh, that's hunted. Uh, but what hunting does is it keeps a population suppressed so that when you might have a good habitat year, uh, the breeding birds are not there, or the potentially breeding birds are not there. Uh, blueing teal, uh, uh, it's a habitat thing but they've almost certainly been over-harvested. But particularly in places like Louisiana, where on average, the average hunter gets 22, 24 ducks uh, a year. If you were to look at the average here, it would be maybe two ducks, that sort of thing. So, Do you think that possibly the, the demise as well is the fact that we, we have bigger power boats if you look back at the 1960s yeah. and 70s where we had small little boats right. going click, click, click. Yeah. The shoreline is completely, um, there's no more riffling beds. Everybody's putting rocks down to yeah. protect their shoreline. Yeah, yeah. Weed beds have disappeared. Like yeah. These, you know, like mud heads are gone. Like so many yeah. species are gone that we grew up with. And I, I'm attributing it to man. We're the worst culprit for, for you know, wanting to live on the water and have our big speed boats and... So on and so forth. Well, well, I, I think I think you can bring it back to man. Some aspect. I mean, it's man who's changed the habitat, changed the habitat of the prairies, changes the habitat here. Uh, sometimes the changes have been positive, but I think when it comes to ducks, and that's something that I feel fairly confident about uh, when I talk about duck populations and continentally. Lots, lots of things, lots of things like that. Uh, but it's, it's tough. People want to be near the river, of course. And uh, well, when I look at our own cottage, you know what I mean. Uh, uh, some of the changes that that we've made there are not all that wildlife friendly. I mean, no question about it. And uh, like by uh, selling perch way back when, before I became a convert. So, <laughs> so there must be a question here. Problem or? Oh, I think they're a, a big problem, uh, but it maybe depends on, it's a little nuanced. Uh, I'm not so sure they're a, a problem for something like a walleye or pickerel, uh, but they certainly are, I believe, for perch. Uh, these invasive species all, almost always take a toll on, on something. But, well, I believe the Baltic, I believe uh, they came in on... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the ships that, uh, you know, that came over and bilge water and things like that. Uh, uh, Stephanie, were you? Yep. Any online questions? 
Oh, online questions. Oh, man, online. Mm. Any more questions uh, from the crowd in person? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for this talk. Really very interesting. And I think we have a perfect venue tonight. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Tell me, give me some impressions. Like, it's interesting to me of someone who's seen the river before the dam went in. Yeah. Okay, so you're thinking in terms of the impact of the dam? Yeah, and the sorts of changes in the yeah. habitat and, and the... I, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, um, yeah, it's interesting. Maybe the, the biggest impact in my memory is Long Sioux Rapids. Uh, we sacrificed the Long Sioux Rapids in the name of progress. Now, when I pay a power bill, it's probably, you know, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue a little bit differently, but, but that was a magnificent uh, stretch of water. What, the, uh, the river dropped something like, uh, over the course of a mile, something like 16 feet or something, in the spring when the, when the ice was breaking up and uh, going through the, uh, the rapids and big pans of ice would be driven up into the sky. But that's not what you're talking about. Uh, but broadly speaking, that's a big, big change. And from a sentimental perspective, a nostalgic perspective, important. Uh, I, I, how did the dam change things? I, it changed water flow. Water flow now is more regulated when you look at uh, the the need to regulate for the turbines and what have you, uh, for the seaway and things like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> it, had to, it had to have quite an impact. I mean, we know how, broadly speaking, dams impact uh, uh, movement of animals, uh, movement of fish, of course. Um, if you were on Hamilton like yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Those kinds of stories, I, I could, you know, we could sit and have a beer and uh, maybe a couple and uh, talk about those. Uh, a lot, lots of those kinds of changes, for sure. Uh, just uh, when you look at the dam and also the seaway, I, I, I'm curious to know what impact uh, boats and wave action and what have you that we've been talking about, wakes and whatnot, impacted not only fish uh, and uh, other things, but uh, or indirectly the fish through, through let's say, the vegetation. So, so the, the reed beds that we see, I've had people say to me, oh, the reed beds are still there. You talk about, you know, loss of reed beds. Well, some have uh, been lost, but, but still they're there in uh, where they've always been. But what they aren't is the density. I'll bet you, I'll bet you we're de talking about in some cases 60% uh, of the, of the reed bed has been lost. And the place, the reed bed uh, um, around Marlins, where uh, Marlins uh, Apple Place, uh, where I shot my first two green blueing teal, okay, uh, I've been doing some, again, horseback type surveys, and, and the little clump of vegetation is still there, but I'll bet you uh, it, it, it's, it's only half of what it was. It's only, so subtle stuff, things like that, and you know, as a scientist, you can't just, you know, <laughs> you have to be a little bit circumspect and what have you, uh, but there's been some real changes. And, and certainly the naturalist in me, and I like to think of myself as a naturalist, um, 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 
um, because I studied behavior as opposed to something I could measure, you know, and then put into a computer and uh, apply a statistic to. Uh, there's some really interesting uh, changes. Uh, and some things that have happened, uh, Adrian Andre, one of the uh, noted fishermen in the Lancaster area, I remember him saying to my friend Robin Casgrain, um, there's been a big three-day east wind. And he said, I have seen a fish kill like I have never seen before. Uh, and, and I don't know why those fish died. Something to do, obviously, with, with the weather events. Uh, but it was so interesting to hear somebody like that making observations. That man was on the river every day of his life. Uh, and it was so nice to be able to tap into, you know, those kinds of things. But it's, but it's tricky. So, I mean, I, 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 feel, I, I feel really confident in what I say about ducks. Because I had to get within 30 yards of a duck to shoot it. So that was my focus. But then when it broadened out and I started to have a better sense of uh, what was going on continentally and whatnot, and I saw some of the changes, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was interesting. And just briefly, speaking of politics, Ducks Unlimited, okay? If you have 20 bucks and you want to save a wetland for whatever reasons, uh, uh, give it to Ducks Unlimited. So I'm a fan. But what I'm not a fan of is an organization like Ducks Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited allowing hunters to believe that they're having a major impact on the so-called fall flight. The ducks that come out of predominantly the north so that we can hunt them. Uh, they are saying habitat is the critical factor here. And it's absolutely true what they're saying. But they don't address the impact of hunting. And the hunting, like I mentioned earlier, keeps the population from coming, coming back, or potentially at any rate. Uh, and so Ducks Unlimited is a really interesting uh, business, if you will, uh, operation because they have now shifted largely from the hunting population and supporting hunters or say, give me your 20 bucks and I'll produce more ducks for you um, uh, to now wetlands and water and water quality. Extremely important. In fact, I think Ducks Unlimited are just making a smart business decision, uh, getting out of the duck hunting business. And uh, But interestingly, it used to frustrate me when people would talk about with black ducks, which I knew uh, something about, and they'd talk about, yes, 10, 15 percent of the population of black ducks can be attributed to uh, uh, human activity, uh, the creation of, of, of wetlands. My, uh, I think, informed opinion is that there was no increase, no uh, additional black ducks produced because of any of our human uh, impoundments and what have you. In fact, beavers could be <laughs> looked at and say, not the savior of black ducks, but, but, but producing way more habitat than we in our projects. Uh, anyway, but that's, that's, oh, you can see that that's a bit of a rant, right? And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but, uh, but I'm still a, still a fan of Ducks Unlimited. Anyway, were you going to ask me something? No, okay. Okay. Huh? You were going to, oh, uh, eels. So I was wondering if you had any stories of the eels, and that could maybe wrap up uh, our session. Very right. subtly done, eh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, eels. Listen, uh, I got a story to tell you about eels and sturgeon. And uh, uh, because certainly the eel is an indicator species, I would think sturgeon uh, also of the health of the, of, of the lake. Uh, when they were building the seaway, okay, uh, this would be, what, in the early 50s. Um, uh, one of the things that, that I always found am uh, amusing 
was that there'd be guys on Hamilton Island who had a boat, and they were, they were, they were fishermen, but they didn't have a fishing rod. They had a net, okay? So they had a boat and a net. And whenever they'd hear the barge, okay, that blasted, uh, you know, uh, uh, do, doing the blasting to uh, uh, form the channel uh, for the boats, uh, these guys would get in their boats and go out and get downstream from the barge. And you'd get three beeps, beep, 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 and they means get the hell out of here. But, of course, these guys would be sitting there with their motors uh, idly. And then you'd hear the uh, boom. And then you would see eels. You'd see a lot of stuff, but you'd see eels and you'd see sturgeon. And these guys would go and they left eels pretty much. Everybody hated eels, but they'd get a sturgeon. And they take it over to Basil Lazor on Tricity Island, and he would uh, smoke it for them. And just one story, okay, I'll, let me end with a very personal story involving Basil Lazor. He saved my life, along with a couple of friends. We were duck hunting in December, and we were, uh, uh, it was a two-day hunt, a weekend hunt, and um, we were uh, just we were near Hopkins Point uh, on, a, on a blind out in the open water. And uh, it was a big east wind on the Saturday of the hunt. And when we put the boat in the blind, okay, all you had to do was take the bow rope and loop it around a, a little post and no big deal because the, the wind was pushing the boat into the blind. The next day, the wind changed. And we're excited about getting out there. It was, uh, it was perfect hunting day. And we get in, and it was my job to, uh, t uh, to uh, tie the boat. Okay? So anyway, uh, we, uh, we get in there, and my two buddies get out on the platform ready to shoot. And I got out there, too. I tied the boat. But I'd only just looped it around the post. And we shot three golden-eyed ducks. They came in, and we shot them. And I said, I'll get the, I'll get the ducks, uh, the boys. So I, I swing around and, and get ready to get into the boat, and there it is, gone. <laughs> and I looked, and about halfway into the lawn there is the boat. So I take all my gear off, and there, there I am in the all-together and, 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 I, and I grab a, a cross piece and slide into the water. Oh, just seized up. And I thought, perhaps the best decision I ever made, except marrying you, sweetheart. Uh, I, uh, the boys helped me back in, uh, into the blind. I get dressed again. And we were out there about three hours. And one of the guys was really really starting to suffer from hypothermia. Uh, and um, anyway, um, we, uh, we shot our guns, but it was the hunting season, so there was a lot of guns going off. Nobody, uh, but then in the mist coming up from Thompson Island, uh, Cameron's Island, uh, we see a boat, and he's pulling our boat behind him. And it was Basil Lazor who'd been out checking his uh, surgeon uh, night lines, and he had uh, realized what had happened, and he came up, and without saying a word or anything like that, uh, just <laughs> gave me the, the rope for the boat, and uh, honest to God, uh, well, honest to God, let me tell you, I was, <laughs> we were all very, very pleased to see Basil. Anyway. Oh, that's the end of the stories, uh, Stephanie. Uh, sorry, uh, it was pretty, pretty rambling, I know. But uh, I used to be much more structured when I was lecturing so that people would know what the point of the lecture was. But anyway. So. Thank you, Norm. Thank you.